Eve, uh, Chief Financial Officer of the company, and Elena Romanova, Investment Relations Officer. So now we're ready to start, and I will pass the floor to Ravshan. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining and uh, spending the time to, to speak with us. Uh, and I'll be more than happy in the uh, next one hour to give you a short intro into the group and what we are represented, and what is our vision, and, uh, where we are moving, as well as to answer your question, whichever may arise. So, Elena, let's go ahead with the presentation. Look, so as a group uh, of today, we are Russia's largest vertically integrated uh, forestry and pulp and paper company. Uh, there is a company who is individually uh, are larger in the size when it comes to the single products like a pulp or, or a plywood. However, nobody is have built a vertically integrated and horizontally integrated holding like we did. Today, the group is represented by two pulp and paper mills by five woodworking facilities, by more than 10 converting plants, out of which seven is located in Europe and three is in Russia, a brand new factory of Gulam products, as well as a brand new factory of the CLT products. As a group, uh, despite of all the challenges uh, over 2020, which came with the COVID, have surpassed uh, close to $1 billion uh, in revenue, and around uh, 250 million in EBITDA. As the market have recovered, uh, all the activity on all the fronts have recovered. We obviously are restoring to the normal level of marginalities. Our marginality by 2020 was around 25%. Our standard level of marginality is around 30 to 35%. So you, I'll speak a bit more in the details, but uh, to give you a glance on a, on a six months uh, basis, uh, we have already um, posted uh, 13.2 uh, billion in uh, EBITDA. So a gross year on year of around 50% and we continue on the same trajectory. <clears throat> in the products where we are uh, located, we are a Russian domicile company, however, a truly international and global from our footprint and presence. We are selling to more than 100 countries and in the products we are holding in a global wise a number two position in the multi-wall sack paper, also called uh, craft paper, uh, number two globally into the packaging behind Mondi, uh, number five globally in the birch plywood. However, with uh, the products uh, and the plans that we are having for the expansion as we speak, we are kickstarting a new plywood mill, and by the end of the next year, we're expanding our existing plywood mill. So we will be moving to a number two to three position uh, globally in a birch plywood. And we are Russia's number one uh, sawing timber producer, and we even further increasing our dominant position in that sector with an acquisition just we recently closed, uh, which is adding about 25% of, of the volume. So as a group, let's move to the next slide, just to give you an idea, our dimension in which position we are located, we are unique into its structure when compared to the international and global peers in a packaging and a paper, we're very similar to the Mondi. Uh, in the plywood, we are very similar to UPM. In the sawing timber and glue on production, we are very similar to Storenzo. However, what makes us unique in comparison to all those names that I just mentioned is our forestry base. We are by far the largest forestry resource company within our global peers. At the same time, we are continuing our expansion and continuing to, to be a number one and grow our forestry base. Now, in this industry in general, <clears throat> there's a key ingredient today is a forestry. So on the slide, you can see that today we are holding of around uh, 10, with in recent acquisition for around by the end of the year would be around 14 million of annual allowable cut, which mean in our forestry resource base, uh, it is uh, absolutely number one in Russia and globally. We are today only utilizing of about uh, five and 5.1 million out of total of 14, so less than 30%. 
And that is enough to have an 80% self-sufficiency in wood. And 80% self-sufficiency in wood, it is by far the, the largest across our international peers. And it gives a, a two um, fundamental uh, strategic um, advantages which we have. First advantage, it is a security of the key ingredient of raw wood. When we look at the products in general, the 50% of all the cost of all the products that is produced in a pulp and paper and forestry and woodworking industry is coming from the raw wood. While you are controlling, um, uh, in our case, an 80% of the self wood, that is a strategic supply, which is uh, a supply of raw wood getting uh, more and more uh, harder um, for availability and the pricing of it is going up. And the second day, it's give you a significant cost advantage when it comes to a cost structure between everybody else. So when looking at the softwood, then can you please go back when uh, just to give an idea to the audience of what we are talking about. So we are talking about when looking at the forest in general and the forest resources. Obviously, Russia holds 20% uh, of all the forest resources as a country. However, what's more important, it holds uh, more than 50% of uh, so-called softwood. In general, when you look at the forestry, there is a two differentiation between the, the forestry. One is a soft wood and one is a hardwood. The soft wood is available in US and Canada, North America, in the Scandinavian countries in Europe and in Russia. The hardwood is more located in around Latin America, Asia uh, and other countries. By its nature, it's uh, the two different, while well, the same tree, which may look from outside, by its nature is a two different uh, products because a softwood have a longer fiber and from longer fiber, you get uh, a more uh, link between the, the fibers when you produce any product, whether it's a pulp or wood, and thus you're getting a much stronger characteristics of uh, whatever product you produce. So anything that needs to have extensibility, durability, uh, a heavy duty a packaging uh, can only be produced from softwood. While the hardwood have a much shorter fibers. So you either produce a tissue, a toilet paper, or you need to mix it with uh, the softwood to make uh, any kind of uh, stronger packaging. So from softwood perspective, when we look at around the world where it's available and where it is uh, utilized, you'll see that in both in North America and in Europe, where the pioneers is Finland and uh, Sweden, they have already penetrated the availability of the forest of around 75%, which means out of all the available forests which they already have, they have used up uh, is as much that any further increase beyond that point, uh, it's very hard. Some because it's a geographic, ecological reasons. Second, it's economically inefficient. And uh, third, which is more and more getting uh, harder for them, they're hitting uh, the fans where they're losing the track between uh, availability of restore and reforest uh, it at the same uh, percentage. So in some countries like in Canada, which used to be around 73 to 75% penetration, they, under the regulatory uh, obligations, they actually reduced it to 69%. Russia, uh, in, in comparison, not only have it large in volume, but also a penetration rate is a very low. And the reason for that is because for the past 40 years, the industry, as a pulp and paper in general, in Russia have been significantly underinvested and overlooked uh, from the big businesses from the investment perspective. So the Russia big businesses invested heavily in steel, in a metal, in, in uh, oil, in, uh, in uh, manufacturing called uh, uh, other dry chemicals, but uh, not into the forest. As a result today, the small country like Finland have a 40 pulp mills while the, the Russia with all its forest resources have only five of equivalent apartments. And we as a company uh, started about uh, five years ago to, to serve uh, as one who is, uh, first of all, you know, serves like a consolidator in the industry. 
Second, the, the company have invested heavily. Over the last five years, we invested more than $1 billion into our assets, a forestry base, and new production volumes, and uh, position ourselves perfectly to expand even further. And, and any growth that comes in the future from the market, we will be able to deliver and because we have the natural resource for that. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to the demand, obviously one part is having a natural resource and have an ability to process it. Second part of it, what's the market and how the market is overlooked. So the market is driven by a few things. First of all, the biggest consumer in our industry is the construction industry. The construction industry uh, itself, it's a huge industry which is growing every year by around 3 to 4%. What is more important is within a construction industry, we're seeing more and more shift into the using wooden applications into building a more sustainable, cheap and faster uh, construction uh, and houses. On the other side is the development um, it's, I don't think it's even development, you can call it a, a skyrocket uh, demand for the e-commerce where all the packaging is used, as well as the producers, uh, traditional producers of dry chemicals, cement bags, uh, food industry, which used to package everything in the plastic bags, are moving into the more sustainable packaging, EA, uh, the craft paper. Other side is a consumer packaging. Other side is obviously a trend into the plastic substitution that we see around the world. So fundamentals of the market, obviously, are very favorable to us. Uh, if we look to the next slide, please, Lena. Uh, another one where it was, uh, all the market grows. <clears throat> yeah, so if you look at the projection of the, the Vision Hunter and the Fisher International, so on average, they are projecting two to five percent growth, depending on which products are we talking about. A two to five percent growth may not, may not look uh, significant in its absolute value. However, given the size of the business, the, the increase is actually huge. Uh, as an example, let me make for the sewing timber, for example. A sewing timber production volume today in the world is a 340 to 350 million cubic meters per year, the demand for it. A 2% growth every year, it is an 80 million uh, more plywood, uh, more sewing timbers that needs to be produced. To produce 80 million more sewing timber, you need to process and harvest uh, and around 180 to 190,000 of the raw wood. And where the 190,000 additional raw wood will come if the harvesting penetration rate in all the traditional places is already at a very peak level. And thus, <clears throat> on one side, basically having a strong fundamentals of the demand. On the other side, the, the current traditional producers and the, the, the players who is holding the key position in the industry are limited in their capacity to expand to, to meet the, the growing demand. So we, as a company, uh, believe the position are very well to actually ride uh, this uh, wave. And one is obviously the, the forest resources. Uh, second is with our cost structure. Lena, if you can please go into the, our cost uh, curve slide. So on the cost curve, I already mentioned that the raw wood being a key ingredient into the production, but just to give you also idea, in the entire production chain, there's the cost lines is 50% is a raw wood, a 25% is a labor cost, and the rest of 25% is usually electricity, energy, administrative cost, as well as logistics. So the 75% of the entire production cost is the two ingredients, a raw wood and the labor cost. On the raw wood, on the top left chart, you will see that uh, our cost at a mill gate today is around $34, while all our competitors having uh, two to two, three times uh, more expensive cost. As we progress through the year, well, for us, and over the past few years, we've been maintaining this cost of $34, and actually, we're decreasing it as we progress with our own efficiency. All other producers over the past 10 years 
have experienced the increase of around 50% of the robot cost. And as we progress uh, for the next five years, that the, the increase in the cost structure would, will only continue. So when you have a, such a significant difference in a raw wood structure, and I don't need to explain you a difference between a labor rate and a labor cost in Russia versus uh, European countries where the main producers are, obviously our cost structure on all the products, whether as being a paper or the sawing timber or the plywood is one of the cheapest uh, in the world. <clears throat> With such a cost structure and ability to increase a production because we have a natural resource, while the market fundamentals are strong. Our strategy as a company uh, on one side, uh, it's uh, very simple. We're gonna planning to expand our size of the group by investing into the increase of the production, increase of uh, automation and efficiency, as well as open the, the bottlenecks and diversification of our current portfolio. So this is, as a group at a high level glance, what we are represented. And uh, for that, we have developed a number of projects, which is already in implementation phase. We have kickstarted uh, most of them. And in 2022, by the end of 22, by the end of 2023 and uh, 2024, half of it, every year we will be bringing a new volumes, which would increase the, the size of the processing of our wood, which is available for us as well as increasing, obviously, the EBITDA and the, the group itself. While implementing those projects, I already mentioned that over the past five years, we as a group invested of around $1 billion into the, the, our existing production phase. And you may ask that, look, um, uh, what was a return of that investment? A return of that investment that over the past five years, uh, we grew from being of one and a half billion ruble EBITDA company to this year, the consensus of uh, everybody is around uh, 28 uh, billion ruble. And it's more or less very close to uh, what is a, a real projection is. So a uh, huge growth. And we now basically are the leverage while we came into the IPO, all the IPO money and proceeds was a cash in into the company. Uh, very mm, comfortable from the debt level. Our debt level uh, was around uh, 1.3 by mid year of this year, and we're planning to maintain this uh, at this level. And with all the investments that we're making, the, the return on it is at least 20 to 25%. So we are planning to double the size of the group of what we're having by the end of 2024, early 2025. So Expansion through utilization of uh, existing uh, forestry base, through implementation and execution of the number of projects, which is a brownfield uh, in its nature for us. All those projects we have already done uh, in a prior history. So it's not uh, something new or um, uh, something that we don't have an experience or we, we see any execution risk is. Uh, with their implementation, we're doubling the size of the group uh, in three years. Now, there's other two germs that we have you know, with our ability while we're executing this. One germ is, as I mentioned, the, the industry in Russia is very deconsolidated and is uh, heavily underinvested. With us having a uh, financial ability, to look uh, into the market and bring out of the, uh, a few, but uh, very important uh, M&As and maximization of the capacity. Uh, we also, with our financial ability, are planning to do that. And a good example of this is, I'm gonna make two. One is a Novo Inisiesk uh, woodworking facility. We have completed the M&A of it in September 15. Uh, the total purchase price of around the four and a half billion ruble. The asset by itself will bring us around one and a half to two billion uh, rubles of EBITDA every year. On the other side, it's adding a 2.2 million annual allowable cut, 
Mm, and it's uh, very close to our existing Lesasibirsk facility where we have a uh, Sai Energy you know, with existing uh, mill. And we are planning to having 100% utilization of a different forestry base. So it was all kind of uh, MNAs, which we um, closely monitoring, just to give you an idea. We was looking at this asset for more than one year and took us a one year to, to complete uh, the MNA. But this is uh, exactly the opportunities which we are looking into the market, which can potentially even further speed up the growth of the group. On other side, we have a large uh, project uh, in, which we're planning to implement. Uh, the no decision has been made yet on it. However, we're actively pursuing and uh, preparation for it. It's a construction of the huge, large uh, pulp mill. Uh, a pulp, just to give you an idea of the market, a pulp market globally is around 50 million tons per year. It grows about uh, 2 million, uh, 2% uh, every year. A 2% out of 50 million is around uh, 1 million new pulp, which is needed to the world to, to just satisfy the, the, the demand. That 1 million ton, to build a 1 million ton of pulp, you need to invest around one and a half to two billion dollars. The construction phase is three and a half to five percent to, to, to five years. You need to have a seven million uh, cubic meters of annual allowable cut of forest to, to be able to do that. You need to have a ecological permits and it needs to be located uh, logistically in such a place where um, you can have an efficiency on one side of uh, wood processing, on another side so, of the global uh, uh, footprint to, to distribution of it. As thus, as I already mentioned, the forestry being such a scarcity resource, uh, today around the world, the, the pulp mill is not growing uh, on the trees. Mm, there have not been no uh, new pulp mills uh, in the world for the next past few years. There's only been one, which is UPM is, uh, I'm talking about, there have been uh, uh, restorations, upgrades, modernizations, but from the greenfield, a brand new, there only been one major, is a UPM built in Ecuador. But again, they're building it in hardwood, but not in a softwood because the softwood is not available. So this is going to be uh, a softwood uh, available into the uh, market. Uh, potentially, if we kickstart it from January of 2022, it will take three to four years uh, to construct. By itself, the investment is around 150 billion rubles. The EBITDA of the project, it's about 50 billion rubles by itself. Uh, the project is big, so we are taking very cautiously in the preparation for it. And on the other side, uh, we are structuring a project financing, meaning the project will be realized without consolidation to the group and with no recourses to the group. It's going to be a standalone project where we'll be only investing of around 20 billion rubles in it. However, once the, the, the project is operate and start generating its own cash flow, we will be able to consolidate it back by buying out some financial partners. So in our ideal world, if uh, everything works as we are projecting, again, today, if we say we are around 28 to 30 billion, Ruble EBITDA by 2024, 2025, we are around 50 billion uh, EBITDA with all the investment projects of organic growth, which we are doing. By that time, the Segeja West project is uh, coming up, which is a 50 billion ruble by itself. That's already a 100 billion ruble of EBITDA. And we're also looking at an MA opportunities uh, to further consolidate uh, and have an increasing in efficiency. So overall, uh, we believe we are extremely well positioned to grow at a significant uh, pace in the next uh, five to six years. And we have all the ingredients, which we believe for that. We had uh, a hardship uh, on the financial leverage, but with an IPO proceeds, our debt is uh, very little now, which opens up our opportunity to, to one side invest and still keep a financial health of the company at very comfortable level. So with this, I would prefer to spend more time on answering uh, questions 
because I can speak about our company for, for many hours. Uh, so, as I, oh, yeah, as I see, there are some questions in the chat and probably we should start from the last one. Uh, taking into account, we have just talked about Segeja West. Who are the financial investors? So the financial investors are banks. Now we're talking about uh, two commercial banks, which would be uh, financial investors. No, we are not yet signed agreements with them. We are negotiating the terms and conditions. So I will not disclose it at this point of time. And the other questions we have are, um, do we prefer to lease or buy Forrester assets? Please explain the choice. Yes. So look, uh, the forestry assets, in general, how the, the forest is given in Russia. In Russia, by the legislation, you are not able to buy the forest. You are able to buy the leasing rights for the forest. How, so what when we're talking about uh, for our forestry resource, our forestry resource is uh, leasing for 49 years for the fixed amount of uh, money, which can only be inflated uh, on the inflation rate every year. And the way that the contract is structured is that you are impossible to break it on one side, neither from government side, nor from the business side. You can only break it if you are violating a regulation and mismanaging your forest tremendously. But then if you're doing that, it is a crime and it's more problematic just losing the, the leasing agreement. It's actually a criminal sentence for it. However, on the other practical side, just to give you an idea how it works, so on one simple example. So we are building a garbage plywood mill as we speak. That is investment of about 12 billion ruble, also done in the same format as the Segeja West, exactly the consolidated from the group of the asset, which we are planning to bring into the group of asset from January 1st of 2023. But the logic was exactly the same. We came into the region and we said, look, we are want, wanting to invest and build a production facility. Now we are going to create a jobs. So we're going to pay the taxes. Uh, however, for that, we need a forest which will be able to satisfy the needs you know, of the production facility for basically indefinitely. So the government look at the, the, the region. We built the factory and they gave us a forest around it. So once the plant is operating, you start utilizing this forest and the forest land is such in a size that you can indefinitely use it with the reforestation and everything. Now, in all practical sense, if the government, let's say, in 10 to 15 or 20 years, for some reason decided to change it and decided to break the lease. So they're going to lose on one side uh, a, a rental which we are paying for this lease. And the secondly, there is no other consumer of that forest available. On the other side, the factory will lose its uh, wooden supply, thus paying less taxes, thus uh, people losing their jobs. So in all principle sense, it's not like you have a one forestry and a 10 factories where everybody is competing for the same forestry, like for example, in Finland. In Russia, it's a forestry and a one operator which utilizing that forestry. So breaking the, the lease or not continuing it doesn't really make any sense or any benefit to anybody. And thus, if you look at it in a nature by law and legal, it is a leasing, but in a principle and in a real life, it's almost ownership. And there is another one, um, one of our favorite ones. To what extent are European lumber prices affected by North American volatility? And could you also comment on sack paper and pulp uh, price trends over the last year and prospects um, as economists recover? Yeah, that's one of my favorite questions about the lumber prices <laughs> and the soy and timber price. Look, uh, the big problem with our industry, and I feel for the, all the analysts and investors uh, and all the bankers and the brokerage firms which try to cover our industry, 
is that unfortunately there is a very little publicly available indicators which you can look and you say, okay, I understand what's happening with the market. And those ones who, which are available, those are <laughs> uh, actually are misleading rather than giving you a glance. You mentioned a lumber forwards in North America. A lumber and so in timber, by its nature, it's more or less the same product. Yes, a lumber is a bit more warped on. Yes, it's have a different size, but more or less the same product. However, in a normal and uh, real world, a North America market is fully integrated into itself. What I mean, the Canada producing a lot of uh, wood, the US producing a lot of wood, and everything is consumed by United States because in United States, 90% uh, of all the housing is a woodworking house, is a wood housing. Very rarely where a Canadians, when they have an excess, they would came into the international market and sell something, some excess. And very rarely when America, US would buy any sawing timber or lumber from, the, from other places. So in the real world, the market is fully integrated into themselves and does not correspond to what's happening in other parts of the world. So Russian producers, European producers are more focused on Europe, Russia, Asia, Middle East, and it's, it's basically two different prices. Now, what's happened in the North America, just to, to give you an idea. In North America, because in 2020, Canada did not produce a lot of forest. And in 2021, there was a lot of demand for the new houses. In US, a price of a lumber went up from a normal levels of 450 to $500 per one cubic meter to a $1,600 to a $1,700. In a peak, it was some, like one week was $1,900. So a four times increase into the price. Then once the supply and demand balance more or less balanced, the price dropped back to about 500, uh, 550 levels. In the rest of the world where we are represented, the price did not jump more than four times. It only went up by 50%. And there's a combination of things. One is because raw wood became more expensive. Second is because the, uh, the, the demand was strong. And thus, we don't have this uh, correlation. It is true that some European producers when the US prices are very high, like $1,600, they have a swing ability to produce a lumber and they do sell it to United States. However, this is less than 10 to 15% of the total production volumes and that it doesn't move market neither one way or, or another. So yes, the products are very similar. However, it's a two different markets and there's what's happening in with the North America prices going up and down does not really correlate with uh, what's happening in this part of the world. The driver of the, the price for sawing timber in the world is a China. The China is by far the largest consumer of the sawing timber. Uh, we selling 50% of our sawing timber into the China. And uh, the China market is driven obviously by two things. One is the construction. Second, uh, China is importing a lot of raw wood out of Russia normally. However, in from January 2022, as you know, there's, there's a ban in Russia of exporting a raw wood. So the China market would still remain as a, a good uh, premium market for us for, for many, many years. Second part of your question on the sack paper and a pulp. A pulp and a sack paper normally goes hand by hand with a lack of about six months. So basically, when the, the pulp is going up, a sack paper prices would go up with a lack of about six months. And it's going vice versa. You may see that in the Q1 or Q2, the pulp prices was already around the $1,000 or 1,000 euro. While the sack paper price is, uh, was growing more rapidly. And only in Q3 of this year, and we almost close the year, so I can close the quarter so I can speak about it. Only in Q3 of this year, the paper prices for, the, for us have reached uh, the prior to COVID prices. So we have surpassed uh, about $700 per, per one ton. The reason for that is the pulp have a lot of applications and it's more treated as a commodity product, while the, the paper is more integrated into the production chain. So the, the lack of the planning 
into the production is a six to nine months and they maintain the stock. And for them, the, the price volatility is not uh, welcomed neither by them nor that uh, producer. Um, and there's another question. What are the rules in Russia around replanting forests once you harvest mm -hmm. them? And how does they compare to North America and Europe? Yes. So in Russia, actually a regulation when it comes to the forestry management, it's more harsher than in uh, Europe. Uh, in Russia, you are obligated for every tree that you cut to replant one-to-one. Um, -one. So there is a two methodologies. One is uh, you're replanting a small seeds, which we are doing about 90% of the, the times. And at 10% of the times, there is a second methodology where you don't cut the, the, the square completely, you leave the islands, and this is what's very common in Europe, actually. As you leave the islands, and then you're doing the seeds recovery and a natural recovery of the forest. We do it about 10%, in a 90% of the times we are replanting the small tree one-to-one. -one. We're actually investing into the, the facility where we're growing our own trees. Uh, but the regulation is uh, very harsh. There is the, the myth of the, um, that in Russia, the forest is uh, mismanaged and the, the forest is uh, underlooked. Uh, actually, it is very much regulated. Uh, one of the actual reasons, if you look at our forest, you will see that 85% of our forest is FSC certified. Uh, the FSC certification, it's the Forest Stewardship Counseling. It's an international body which goes around the world and actually certifying the, the forest. And it takes usually one to two years for them to certify and then they come every year with a uh, very detailed audit. What they certify the forest and it's basically f from the, how the harvesting is done, whether it's done in a sustainable manner, as well as how it then goes through the chain to the finished product. So the, the entire chain. So from the perspective of the FSC certification, we are today, uh, when we're talking about 85%, we are aiming to 100% and we are not only reached 100% because every year we're adding new forests and it takes a one, two year to certify it again. But in compared to international or Europeans, let's say the second place is the Billy Root, who only have 68% of their forest FSC certified. The third place is Mundi, who have only 45% of their forest is certified. Um, and the last one I see in the chat uh, is again about Segeja West. Will the mm -hmm. commercial banks be investing in the equity of Segeja West? So they are investing into the Segeja West as an equity, but in the real world, it's a kind of quasi equity. So basically what we are agreeing with the banks, they are investing in equity into it. However, at the moment when they're investing, we also agreeing with them an exit mechanism. When and what price and when we're gonna buy them out. And for them, the equity, it's in so-called uh, becoming, uh, becoming uh, a, a credit where they know it's a guaranteed uh, repaid or a guaranteed buy out by, by a certain a trigger mechanism. So it is a quasi equity rather than a true equity. Leonid, can we announce that um, investors can somehow add their questions? Probably with yes. arms. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have another question written in uh, QA. Uh, what will the maintenance capex be once if the reaches 50 billion? Mm -hmm. So the, the maintenance capex today, as we, we will look as a company, is around uh, four to five billion uh, on annual basis, with all the replenishing and uh, investment into doing into the modernization. The maintenance capex will actually grow, but the growth will be insignificant in compared to the new asset base. So basically we're increasing the asset base two times, but the maintenance capex will only increase 30 to 40%. The reason for that is as we're investing into the new facilities, we're also investing today into the modernization and automation of existing 
in our facilities, which requires less maintenance as we progress. So answering your question directly, with a doubling the size of the group, when we're gonna reach a 50 billion, the maintenance capex will go roll by 30 to 40%. Thank you. Uh, dear audience, let me remind you that if you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand and unmute yourself, or you can uh, text in the Q&A and we will read it out. So please do not hesitate to ask the question because we have 14 minutes left. Okay, thank you. We have uh, another question. How big the opportunity to acquire smaller competitors? Well, the opportunity is big. Uh, won't be lying to it. However, what uh, we also are looking at, just to give you an idea, on every month in our pipeline, we have like a 10 M&A opportunities, which we are looking at. However, when we look at the M&As, we are going into the great detail, into the due diligence of the technical analysis, in the due diligence of the forestry base, and uh, what energy it will have, what strategic view. And in many cases, when we look at it, we will find out that the forestry resource uh, base is either already used up so much that is not uh, interest of ours. Secondly, that the, the facility it's already fully, basically, morally and technically obsolete, and you need to tear it down and, and uh, build a new one. However, the price which they want uh, it is, does not correspond to it. So the opportunities is a lot. However, out of those, a lot of opportunities, uh, to be very honest, there's only a few germs, as I call them, in the market, which we are um, very close, they are looking. We are know them very well. We watching and monitoring and following them over the last three to five years. So for those ones, when the timing is right and the price is right, we'll definitely will act. However, it's not like a global, you just go and you, you, you buy everybody once a day because um, 80 to 85 percent, it's such a large percentage. Those are inefficient uh, assets which doesn't cost the money which the sellers is asking for. Thank you. We have another one. Uh, how do you account for your timber assets and your accounting? Do you revalue assets each year in line with current timber prices? So our timber assets, when we look at the, I guess the question was about the forestry asset base. So on our forestry asset base, we are applying the same methodology as all the international peers does, which is a Mondi and the Billy Root and the SE and Holman. Our forestry base is treated as a long-term leasing with asset and liability on the both side. On the timber uh, side, uh, I guess uh, if I I guess another question would be uh, facilities of the timber. I'm not sure about the question, but I guess the question was more about the forestry. Because the timber itself, it's not revalued. The forestry uh, can be treated differently. Thank you. So we have 10 minutes left. Please ask your questions if you have any. Hi, uh, this is Oksana from Solo Capital. Let me take this opportunity to ask um, a question. So considering the nature of your business, do you face any seasonal effects on the company performance due to the wildfires in Russia? Uh, how do you protect your assets from the negative impact? And are you prepared for the abnorm abnormal weather shifts and very dry summers? So how it overall affect the market as a whole as well? Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for the question. So look, overall, uh, our industry have a seasonality effect indeed that's related more into the construction industry. So the construction industry, as I said, it serves about 60 to 65% of the demand of the, the, the group, all the products of the group. And the construction industry by its nature in a winter uh, months is slowing down because the construction is slowing down when the temperature drops. And actually, depending on how cold is the winter or how warm is the winter, it can the, the degree of drop can be different. But naturally, the end of Q4 and the, the Q1 is a lower period of time 
the Q2 is increase of activity, Q3 uh, is uh, the Q2 and Q3 basically a peak of activity, the Q3 more being a peak of activity levels. So yes, there is a seasonality in place. It varies a bit between the, the, the product and the different product have different seasonality, but general trend. And if you look at our group results, uh, we basically always going through, through that chain as well. Now, on the forestry and the fires, a very good question. Also, the, the one that is uh, very often asked. Uh, look, here's the two things uh, for people to consider. First, the climate in Russia naturally is not uh, creating an opportunity for the natural fires. Like in Karelia, in the, in the western part of our forest resources, during the summer, during the day, is plus 30. During the night, is plus 6 only. And usually, it's coming with the rain. So it's, when the natural fires occur, let's say, in California, I understand it's plus 35 during the day and during the night. And it's a dryness, so you have the, the ability to, to the natural fire to create. In Russia, is a very uncommon. So in 90% of the chances, when you look into all the forestry um, uh, fires that's happened in Russia, and then you go into the negotiation and in the cause uh, of, of those fires, it's usually a, a human mistake or a man-made um, which started. Second, you know, the, if you also look into the history of Russia fires, they have never started and never made any major damage into the forestry of uh, business, basically in a, in a forest area which were managed by the business. It usually starts in a wild forest under the government and not in a business area. The reason for that uh, is because once you get a forest under the leasing agreement, you are obligated actually to build a water fence around it and to do, uh, without giving into more a lot of technical details, but uh, you basically doing a special works to protect your forest. In our case, we actually went into the overlooking with the satellites, um, uh, pictures and uh, live satellite, uh, sometimes uh, pictures of our forestry. We also have a special cruise that goes around the forest, but basically <clears throat> the, the forest into the business hands, regulatory obligated to be protected by the certain measures. A, it's a water channeling, B, it's the, the, the middle cuts where you create the, the natural fence and separate it from the wild forest, which prevents you uh, from the, even if there is in a neighborly uh, forestry to, to fall into your forest areas. And once you do that, but for some reason, if there is actually a major forest which actually burn your forest area, then the government, a part of the leasing agreement are obligated to replace that, that uh, forestry area with a new area, which is, have not been damaged. So as a business, we are doing our part of the job by protecting the forest and we, we're taking it very seriously because that is our strategic asset for many years to go. But the government is also giving you a comfort level that if you did everything and you still uh, somehow end up by the fire because I did not look up for the wild uh, forest, then I will give you another forestry area one-to-one -one return. Thank you. And we have uh, five minutes left, so we are ready to take one more question. So, please. Uh, hello, it's Matvey Tais from Silver Capital. So, um, now um, we are looking for this uh, CO2 emission, like green gas, green gas uh, uh, decrease of the uh, uh, emissions. So, and uh, uh, forestation is one of the way how to decrease uh, uh, your greenhouse numbers, basically. Because, like, uh, I I'm just uh, uh, here back from Ian Plus call, and they plan to uh, compensation, like huge spending on compensation of uh, CO two. And uh, do you see it as a, like potential business for you? Do you have already requests for these green certificates? And uh, how do you look at this one? Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Indeed, 
uh, we did an analysis on one of our forestry areas in, in Karelia, and we obviously ending up with our forest resource base with a huge you know, credits which would be available for us because we are carbon negative in compared to other producers. Our production facilities by its nature uh, is not like uh, steel producers or oil producers. We are technologically uh, at, uh, very little on emission uh, in general. With our plan with modernization by 2025, well, our production emissions will be zero anyway. Right? Because for us, it's much easier to, to achieve with uh, very little investment, in which we're already doing. So then we're ending up with a huge forestry area, which is a credit. Now, that can be a business by itself, where you sell that excess credit to the, the EM Plus or to anybody else. However, uh, at this point of time, there's no regulation in place, and the regulation is already in a part of the processing. Our chief executive officer is actually part of the, the working group at the government with uh, structuring and, uh, and providing our opinion on, on this uh, manner. So we don't want to speculate on it before there is no regulation. But uh, for us, it's at least would be a zero effect. But potentially, huge be could be a huge boost and a benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions, please? Okay. So maybe I will ask uh, the last one, and we can finish. So uh, could you please tell us about uh, any government support that industry where Sigeja is involved in? Uh, does, uh, do you receive any government subsidiaries for the wood, pulp or paper industries? Yeah. So look, there is no direct support from the government on, on any subsidiaries that you would receive. What you have, you have basically the government uh, look at the forestry industry that the industry requires, because it's again was significant underinvested, requires a significant investment into it for many years. For, for the next 10 to 15 years, thus government supports the investment. And by supporting investment, I mean it's uh, the cheap leasing uh, agreements for the forestry. It's sometimes a tax breaks, 50% property tax and 50% uh, asset tax, net income tax when it comes to the new investment into the processing of, of the wood. Uh, however, on the other side, there is no direct grants which the forestry industry would receive. On the other side, we're also receiving uh, uh, some logistic subsidy, but it's not a pulp and paper industry. It's all the exporters of the Russia uh, are participating in that pool, and actually our portion or share of it is a minimum compared to everybody else. But uh, psychologically, yeah, but just psychologically, it just uh, the people are looking, especially in the last development on the additional taxation, which is the government is looking into some steel companies, for example, the, the psychology that the government have into this, the steel producers uh, that look for the last 10, 15 years, I helped you to develop. You are now all the big boys that making big money and paying a big dividend. Where is my cut? On the forestry industry, they look that look, this industry is still very young. That needs a, a, a huge uh, development and investment for many years to come. So at this point of time, I'm sure for the next 10 to 15 years, uh, they will do, be doing everything possible to, to help the industry to grow. Thank you, Rafshan and Elena. Well, I think we're ready to finish. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, thanks.